And I kind of feel like that's been kind of the kind of the catalytic thing is is housing affordability that's really brought the urbanism issue kind of to the forefront and in the zeitgeist in a lot of ways. And so I kind of feel like I kind of started my channel at a fortuitous time where that was emerging as something that people cared a lot about. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Simmerman, and that is the one and only The City Nerd, Ray Delahanty, uh, with The City Nerd YouTube channel. I'm super, super excited to share this conversation with you. We are gonna talk a little bit about some of his most popular videos and some of his biggest surprises uh, that he has seen as he's been traveling around the globe, uh, profiling various cities, urbanism, and all sorts of really cool stuff from a mobility perspective as well. Uh, hey, let's get right to it because it's a long one. Let's jump into it with Ray. Ray, welcome. Thank you. Or I should say, welcome city nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, city nerd. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's a real, a real joy and uh, honor to to have you here on the podcast. You and I uh, got to share uh, a platform stage uh, at the Strong Towns National Gathering in Charlotte, North Carolina, back in May, and that was a, a, a hoot, a lot of fun. Uh, but why don't you just take an opportunity to uh, introduce yourself to the audience? I'll give you the floor. Yeah. So I'm Ray Delahanty, uh, otherwise known as City Nerd. Actually, somebody, <laughs> somebody ID'd me at a restaurant up in Seattle um, a couple of days ago and said, are you the City Nerd? So I've never heard the City Nerd before, but I guess I'm the City Nerd. Anyway, so I started a YouTube channel called City Nerd back in, I guess, July of 2021. So a little over two years ago now as kind of like a sabbatical project i thought i was going to take like six months off of work and and you know doing some youtube stuff was part of what, what i wanted to do with my time off and um it kind of quickly got traction and started growing a a viewer base and it got to the point where i thought you know what? i should probably just keep doing this and i'll delay going back to work a little longer and it's kind of continued to grow so that's kind of my new job i i run a youtube <laughs> channel it's so funny that you know, July of 2021 is kind of your your jumping off spot. Um, it, it's kind of my jumping off spot for uh, the YouTube channel as well. Uh, it did exist a little bit prior to that, but it was really when I uh, had Jason Slaughter um, from Not Just Bikes on the channel, um, you know, doing an interview just like this. And that was July of 2021. And that really just kind of catapulted uh, my presence both on this this platform as well as out on the audio only platform, which is kind of unique. I, I'm able to produce this uh, these conversations and and uh, I love having it in the video format because then we can pop over and have visuals. And and it's I think what a lot of what we end up talking about here in this, you know, sort of mobility and urbanism perspective is very visual in nature. So I love the the ability to, to, to bring in uh, the visual because it's I, I love podcasts and I love listening to them, uh, but I'm oftentimes wondering, it's like, oh man, I wish I had a visual with that. <laughs> yeah. So. And, and that was part of the reason I think I, I, I started a YouTube channel because I was carrying around a notebook for quite a while with topics that, because I, I was a transportation consultant uh, before I went on sabbatical and I had a bunch of ideas that are like, these are all things that I'm really interested in and nobody's ever going to pay me to research. Like no, no client is going to hire me to talk about these things, but if I ever get a chance, I'll blog about them. But as I thought about it, I thought, you know, these are all very visual and it would lend itself really well to YouTube. So that's why I decided to do it as YouTube instead of a blog or I, don't know, I hadn't even considered a podcast, honestly, but, but uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the things we talk about, are, I, I think, best explained visually. Yeah. So my foray into this world of, of podcasting and then uh, eventually to the YouTube channel was a really a pandemic project. I had previously been filming a documentary and that, you know, obviously the 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 pandemic put a, an absolute stop to that. <laughs> and so I was like, OK, what am I going to do now? And uh, and so I started off with the audio only podcast and kind of move forward. Uh, what was kind of your story? What was what sort of prompted the the desire to you know take a step back and have a little sabbatical and figure out what the next step was? Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of us out here who 
it did some sort of pivot during the pandemic. And, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that. I think all of us responded differently to like the change in work environment or the change in work demands and or maybe uh, looking for a way to move to something different and maybe more fulfilling. And there were other there were other kind of personal things that happened during the pandemic or at least the early part of it as well that really made me think, you know, what, I if, if I want to do something different and talk about the things that I think matter, which I don't know. You don't necessarily always get to do when you're you know, a professional planner. You know, that was kind of the time to do it. I just, I would say it's kind of, it was kind of like a, a catalytic time for a lot of people where if you had an idea of something different you wanted to do with your life, then maybe, maybe the pandemic was what kind of pushed you over into finally doing that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, it certainly was the thing that pushed me towards finally launching that podcast. I mean, I had been on many other podcasts, including Chuck Marone's uh, Strong Towns podcast, multiple times dating, dating back a, a decade. And so I was like, you know, I'd always wanted to do this. And I had a pretty deep Rolodex. <laughs> I'm old enough to remember what a Rolodex is <laughs> of, of people to call on and say, hey, would you like to come and chat and just, you know, you know, riff on, on some stuff. And, and people were like, heck yeah, let's do it. And so I've had the opportunity to, you know, chat. I mentioned Jason, obviously, and that really got me into YouTube, but I also had the honor of, you know, interviewing people like Peter Norton with, uh, you know, the author of fighting traffic and Donald Shoup, uh, you know, from the high cost of free parking. So just really, it, it's been a, a special opportunity, like you said, to sort of pivot and do something a little bit different. And, uh, it, I, I, I hate to say that, you know, something good came from the pandemic, but in some ways, you know, it certainly caused a lot of us to kind of reevaluate what we were doing, how we were doing it and all that. Now, if I remember correctly, um, and I think you just mentioned it in one of your relatively recent uh, videos, uh, there was something about the geography of where you were. So you're, you're from the Pacific Northwest. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And so I think you had mentioned, yeah, uh, I think I might have been suffering a little bit from that seasonal affective <laughs> disorder. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I did. I think I did talk about that. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, um, and, yeah, and so, yeah, talk, talk a little bit about that because you ended up, you know, I, I don't know if it was the next move that you meant, but you made, but uh, you ended up uh, hanging out a, a little bit in Las Vegas, which I used to work in Las Vegas quite a bit uh, right after I launched uh, a firm that I was part owner in. And I had a, a, a project that was happening in one of the neighborhoods out by the, uh, the airport there. So, but this is like, you know, this is like circa late 1990s, early 2000s. What was that like to go from the Pacific Northwest to Vegas? <laughs> well, so at the outset of my channel, the first part of my sabbatical, I went to Mexico and I traveled around for like four months. And the plan was because even though I had spent like the previous couple decades or better part of a couple decades in Portland, Oregon, I'm originally from Seattle and that's where my whole family is. And so I thought when when we come back from Mexico, we'll at least temporarily relocate to Seattle while we reevaluate things. Cause we had put like all our stuff in storage. We, we were homeless and well, I don't want to say homeless, but, but we, you know, we didn't, we didn't have a permanent address. You weren't um, anchored in a location. No, yeah. no. It's a, okay. So we'll get like a 30 day Airbnb in Seattle and, and re reevaluate. And so we're there in December 2021 slash January 2022. And it was like, Seattle doesn't necessarily get a lot of snow. Like, I think there's some years where it doesn't snow at all because um, it doesn't always get that cold. It snowed a lot and it was kind of cool for a couple of days and then it got old fast. And I started to remember just kind of how dreary the winter and parts of the spring and fall can be. And Seattle can be extremely beautiful a lot of the year, probably most of the year, honestly, but those, those three, four, maybe five months of the year, I, I started to really remember how much they wore on me when, when I lived there or when I was growing up there and really the same thing, the same Portland does the same climate characteristics. So I thought, you know what, it would be kind of nice since I don't have a job that's 
located any specific place, how about we just move somewhere that's relatively affordable and has warm weather and still has great like connections if I want to come back to like Seattle or Portland or travel other places. And, and that was obviously Las Vegas because it's still relatively affordable, at least compared to California. The weather can get too hot in the summer, but man, it was great in like January, February, March. I'll tell you that coming out, coming back from Seattle. So that initial move to, to Vegas was, was kind of exactly what I wanted. It was like, okay, this is affordable. It's not as like bike and ped friendly as I would want, but I can make anything work as long as I find the right location that's near like bike paths and stuff like that. So I did that. Um, so, you know, I, I had a, I have have a pretty positive association with that year I spent uh, living in Vegas, basically 2022. A lot of good things happened with the channel and it was just generally a pretty good year. So, but yeah, it it was never going to be, I think, like a permanent, uh, permanent move for me. Right, right. So I, I've pulled up uh, on screen here your your channel, and then I've sorted it based on the oldest uh, videos. So so these are some of the thumbnails from some of the early early work. So this is a solid two years ago. So yeah. I'm assuming these were were some of the videos uh, you know that were from the era, the Las Vegas era. Is that about right? No, no, this is before that. Oh, it's um, even before. I think, wow. I think okay. like the first. Yeah, those first six videos, I think, were all shot in Portland when I was still living in Portland. Um, and then yeah, probably you, you the do next- look a little pasty there in the uh, in the, sh- the thumbnail. <laughs> yeah, and that was back when I was I was kind of I was still trying to figure out what should my thumbnails look like, and I still don't really know. Like I had you know you I read no things clue. like oh yeah you should you should put your face in your thumbnails. It's like eh, I don't know. I'm not I'm not good at that. I'm not good at posing for pictures. So so I'm not I haven't like gone back and updated those, and I, I'm sure I probably won't because I just don't care that much. But um but that's what my thumbnails looked like early on. So all, I think all of those six were filmed in Portland and then probably the next 15 or 16 after that were all filmed at like different places I was staying in Mexico. Oh, wow. You know, I think yeah. I remember that, that era too. I remember some of your, your older videos where you were, you were doing the the filming in, in, uh, in, in Mexico. That was super yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so then the next year's worth of videos after that will all be from Las Vegas. And then there will be another three months where I was just filming videos and wherever I was staying in Spain or Portugal, because I stayed, I, I, I traveled out there in like February, March, April of this year. So yeah, I was going to say that was this year and that was freaking amazing, you know, being able to, to be in that and, and following your journey uh, of, of some of the stuff that would sneak into Uh, into the videos because sometimes they were relevant to where you were because you do have some of those uh that genre of video and then other times it's it's a video that is specific to a a particular um topic and so when we sort this uh by your most popular videos of all time you've got your absurdly uh, undervalued list and uh a video and this this sucker is closing in on 700,000 views and and by the way congratulations on the success um we started at about the same time here in YouTube i'm currently pushing 7,000 subscribers Dude, you're you're up at over two hundred thousand subscribers. <laughs> you got to be pinching yourself, going, "What the hell is going on?" Yeah, a little bit. Um, well, it's funny because <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely have weeks where I go, "Why am I not growing faster? Why why are not more people not watching my videos?" And I, I do have to like kind of stop myself and think, "I only started this channel two years ago. Like everything's cool. Don't." don't sweat like so I I just try not to sweat how any particular video is performing because I do release a video every Wednesday so if I I release something it's just kind of a clunker for whatever reason and I I never really know why people do or don't watch my videos it's like it's no big deal because I'm I'm always releasing another video in like the next Wednesday so I can just you know I'm, I'm on a constant like treadmill of you know, both releasing videos and then just kind of trying to learn what works and what doesn't and what I enjoyed doing, what I didn't enjoy doing, what people responded to and what people didn't respond to. So yeah, when you, when you sort the videos by like the most viewed, that starts to give you an idea of, 
you know, what are like the bread and butter topics that people really like to, to watch me talk about? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. For sure. And, and when you look at it again, uh, to not to, you know, put too fine a point on it, but clearly the top 10 lists are a popular part of it. And the, the, the list in general, the, are, are, a, a, a genre of video that does quite well. And you do such a great job at, uh, creating these and explaining the metrics that you do, because I find it incredibly frustrating when there's quote unquote, a top 10 list that gets you know picked up by the media and, and it goes around to all the different, uh, you know, uh, magazines and view two videos and da, 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 da. And then you look at it and you go, what the hell are the metrics to this? And so you do a really <laughs> good job. I think it's probably your, your planning and engineering background. You have both, right? A planning and an engineering background. Is that correct? Um, I mean, my, my education is in, well, a little bit, my, my degrees in, uh, plan, I have a master's in urban and regional planning, but as part of that, you can take electives in engineering over in the school of engineering. So I actually maxed out as many electives in the engineering school as I could, because I do, I do have like, I don't know, like I, I have the, uh, quantitative and analytical capability to do engineering. I just don't always like the culture of it. Um, and so actually when I got into my career, I mostly ended up doing engineering work that I couldn't stamp because I'm not a professional engineer, but, it, but the, the, the PE who was working above me would review the work I did and give me feedback and then ultimately stamp it. So I was basically doing engineering work, but I could never call myself an engineer because I'm not a, I'm not a PE, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the reason why I was curious about that is because on your Twitter page, the landing the very first word there of your description is plan engineer. I'm like, Oh, maybe he's also an engineer too. And <laughs> yeah. Cause I, that's kind of the, the origin story with Chuck Marone too, is that he was, an, he was an engineer first, then uh, decided, ah, this is crazy. I need to have more of a planning background and then did, did the planning stuff. Uh, but what I was going to say about the 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 list that you are creating and the, the mechanism that you go forward in creating the metrics seems like, OK, cool. This person is like very thoughtful about how he's going forward on this and, uh, you know, meaningful sort of metrics to it. So I really appreciate that the way you're doing that. And I think it's a, a testament when you look at the popularity of these things. I mean, everybody will quibble and I know that they do. And we can talk about audience and, and community in a little bit. But um, that's, I think, one of the, the, the key, uh, really, I think, success stories to your channel has got to be, you know, being able to uh, make some sense out of some of these things, put, put some metrics out there and say, hey, this is the way I do it. Yeah, you may want to quibble with me a little bit about why I'm doing this over that or whatever, but here it is. And what I love about your delivery on this is you're so deadpan <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, whatever. This is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. You know, take it or leave it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is sort of take it or leave it. And, and it's definitely an intentional choice to spend some time up front and in a, in a video when, where I'm doing like a top 10 list just to explain like exactly what I considered and how I measured it as much as I can. Like, like there, there's a limit to that because I don't want to get, if, if I front load the video with too much explanatory stuff, it slows down the storytelling. So there's always a balance. Um, and I did, I think early on when I was doing these things, I got a lot of comments that were along the lines of, man, can you just get to the point? <laughs> <laughs> but but I also I also got a lot of comments. You no, know, I really 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 value that part, and that's what makes you different. So you should do that. And so that's kind of the way I aired. That's the side I aired on. Um, I'll still get people who will just paste in like the top ten in order. So and and with timestamps on it, so people can just go watch that piece and skip the methodology altogether. But I do think that kind of misses the point because, and I've said this in a few of my videos, but I, I kind of like the top 10 format because it's got like a built in beginning, middle and end, like narrative um, structure to it. But it's also, I've called it kind of like a, a, like a Trojan horse for talking about principles around cities and livability and walkability and transportation. That's really what it is. It's, it's a format where like I'm telling a story about a top 10 list, but it's really, 
it's really a story about like what matters, what, what should you, what should you pay attention to when you're evaluating where to live or where to go visit or, or quality of life. And so that always necessarily includes a lot of opinion on my part. And I'm, I'm upfront about that. I said, this is how I measured it because this is what I think matters, but it's not necessarily going to be the same for you. Maybe you, maybe you care about there being like a great ballet company in the city. Like I don't care about ballet at all. Like right. that probably makes me like a, an infidel or something like that. But, <laughs> but you know, different people care about different elements right. of um, city life or urbanism or urbanity, right. Or culture. And so, so this stuff's endlessly fascinating. Everybody's got their own kind of matrix of, of personal wants and desires. And that's what makes, that's what makes like every city different because got um, every city has like kind of like a different comparative or competitive advantage in in one way or another. Like you know, like Austin, Texas, you know, if you care about live music, like it's going to be really hard to be Austin, Texas, for example. And there are probably other things about Austin, but there's a, there's something about every 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 city has some some particular thing that they're just they do more of or better than uh everybody else and and i like to kind of tease out what those things are yeah yeah well i'll give my plug for austin in the sense that uh, we've uh, lived here now almost a decade uh we made the move from uh, the big island in hawaii uh, the island of hawaii uh to, to here in in austin and we love it i mean it's it's a very walkable bikeable place based on where we chose. We were very intentional about what neighborhood we we chose to live in and uh, made those decisions so that uh, we could live a car light lifestyle. In fact, the, the, the old car that we shipped over from Hawaii uh, hardly ever gets driven, which is, you know, part of my goal is to be able to get around the city without uh, having to drive around here. How long does it take you to really go from, say, concept of, you know, the, the 10 cities that are the absurdly undervalued, uh, you know, hey, that's what I want to do is, is, is dive into that. How long does that concept go from like idea ideation? And I know sometimes your, your, your fans will, will send you, especially out on Patreon, will send you uh, suggestions. Uh, how long does that take to, you know, kind of let it matriculate a little bit in your brain and then be able to do, you know, get to the final product because you're, pro you're producing once a week and it's on Wednesday, right? When they come out. Yep. And it seems to me like there's an awful lot of research that you throw into each and every episode. Yeah. Well, I, I think part of what helps with that is just because I've got like the better part of a couple decades doing planning and engineering, I'm kind of familiar with a lot of data sources and how to, how to analyze them and all the different tools you can use to aggregate or otherwise analyze, you know, census data or house, housing price data or transit, the national transit database. Like I'm, I'm, I know a lot of those things kind of back, back and front. So it's easy for me to think of how I want to measure something and kind of immediately know how to do it. But it does vary a lot by the type of video. So I give myself a week to make a video and like, I don't know, kind of a typical video, you know, I'll start with an idea that I already have. And then, I don't know, like, I guess it goes differently for, for different kinds of videos, but, but I would, I would basically start on Wednesday and finish on Wednesday. And so Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday might be research and writing. Saturday, I'm either like taping what I call my A roll, which is me talking to the camera, uh, mostly off of a script, but it, it it varies a little bit. And then like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday is editing everything together and bringing in images and footage for like my B roll and and my C roll if I need it, and then reviewing it and exporting it and doing all like all the met metadata and stuff probably happens on Tuesday. So I'm really working on deadline all the time. <laughs> I don't, I know a lot of people like the advice is, Oh, you should, you should always have videos done well in advance. So just in case you get sick or like some, something comes up, you'll still have a video to release. I'm just like, if I get sick, I just won't release a video that week. That's, that's kind of my philosophy on it. I'm an extremely deadline driven person like that that my creativity 
in as much as I have any comes from having a deadline. Like, like if I didn't have a deadline, if I hadn't decided to put out a video once a week, I like, it just wouldn't happen. So, and also like, I kind of do everything myself. Like if you have a big team and you have to send something off to the editor or you have a graphics person, then yeah, you do need to start a lot further in advance so that, uh, those like, those people have the lead time they need to give you something back and you give them, give them comments. I don't know. Like I'm, I'm used to that workflow from, from the consulting job I had and, and I'm just kind of tired of it. And <laughs> I'd kinda, I know it's, it's very limiting to what I can do, but I really like doing everything by myself. I might change my tune eventually, but, but it's, it's one of the great joys of, of doing what I'm doing right now is that I can just, and it's not that I'm like a real control freak, although that's probably true. It's just, I don't know. I just like, I just like doing the whole thing myself and and not having to get feedback from anybody. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of the same way. Uh, the only difference on, on my stamp it point from at least for the podcast episodes is that I do tend to, uh, record them in advance. So for instance, this is being recorded on September, Friday, September 22nd. This will go live on uh, Friday, uh, October 27th. And so I know exactly when you are, you know, sort of scheduled into to the whole release uh, platform, but I actually won't touch any of this video and I won't do any editing on any of this until uh, Monday of that week. So it's a very similar type of, of time frame in terms of I won't turn my attention to producing this and getting it out and and advertising uh, that there will be a live premiere. By the way, there will be a live premiere of this being released on that date of Friday, uh, October 27th. I think I've got that date right. <laughs> but yeah, that, whatever that Friday is okay. that week. Gotcha. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it's a similar type of thing of where I'm kind of scrambling. Where I throw a, a little niggle in the whole thing is then I also try to produce a second video and sometimes a third video each and every week on some other uh, topic or some other genre. Uh, for instance, I've been processing all of my ride along videos from Paris uh, the last few weeks. And, and so I try to put the push those out. So it's a, a little bit of a balance because these are long interviews. These are like an hour long conversation. Uh, whereas I try to get my other videos out somewhere in the 15 minute time frame, which seems to be a pretty magical, you know, I'm looking at your, your, uh, your, your links of your videos here. They're all right around that 14, 15, 16 minute range. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of the sweet spot for what I can actually get done in a week, reasonably comfortably. Um, some of my videos were like, I go to another city and I film stuff and I talk about it. Like I've done for like Minneapolis and Montreal and Miami and Charlotte this year. Um, and well, I've got yeah, let's, let's, let's actually turn our attention to Charlotte. So that's where yeah. you and I saw each other yep. was, yep. was Charlotte. And, you know, and so this is a video that is now in your top six of all time videos. And it's only been out there for three months. I mean, that's, that's pretty freaking cool. Um, so, so talk a little bit about that as, you know, when you get a, a video like this, where it's like, it seems like it kind of takes off kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, and again, like the YouTube algorithm is very powerful. Like if, if people are clicking on your thumbnail and watching enough of your video, then the algorithm will spread that video further to what it thinks are the type of people who might respond well to it. And I kind of wonder with these city specific videos, I'm sure the algorithm is smart enough to go, oh, this is about Charlotte. We should show this to more people who live in Charlotte. Because I got lots of comments from people who live in Charlotte, North Carolina when I did the video. I think the other thing that helped, and I've updated the thumbnail since I released it, um, which maybe I shouldn't have. I'm not sure. Um, but I think originally the video thumbnail said uh, the world capital of sprawl or something like that. And that <laughs> was probably, did, yeah. <laughs> that was probably an attention grabber. Um, <laughs> and I do bait, talk about bait. that. In the video. <laughs> yeah, it is clickbait. Um, but, but it is actually something that people have said. It's actually kind of true. <laughs> kind of true. Um, yeah. But, but also, I don't know, but I also, also feel weird about it because people who don't watch the video and, and who, who kind of miss the larger, I don't know, like, like the narrative of like kind of where I go with it and how the city ended up surprising me. Um, if you only got, had the thumbnail and the title to go off of, you'd probably 
think I had a pretty negative view of Charlotte. And so I think I got comments from people who just clearly didn't watch the view at all, who thought I was being like excessively critical of the city where I think, I think the video was doing the opposite. So yeah, I yeah. don't know. It's like well, anything on the internet, like people don't read the article. They, they just comment on what they think the article is about. Yeah. yeah. Well, and one of the reasons why I gave that little plug about Austin is because just Austin, just like Charlotte, is a very, very sprawling city. I mean, we're looking at 326 square miles. And so the dang city grew like an amoeba, you know, through the 1980s and 1990s and early 2000s before they were like, oh, yeah, gee, we should, probably shouldn't be doing this. Uh, but Charlotte, you know, my experience with Charlotte um, of of staying sort of all, along the, 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 the transit line. Uh, heading south um, it was incredibly delightful. It was, it was, there was a lot of really cool urbanism and you capture a little bit in here, but I, I did a freeze frame on this particular uh, screenshot here because you, you sort of point out the, uh, the challenge with the, you know, the entire city and, and the walk score and the fact that it is such a sprawling city and it doesn't necessarily um capture the the subtleties of what it's like to, to live in one of these places because and I've got another uh, interview coming up here with somebody from Charlotte who is a real estate developer that's trying to build walkable bikeable communities in the Charlotte area I mean there's I was pretty impressed there's obviously some pretty good stuff happening there and I didn't really explore out into the hinterlands because I pretty much just rode my bike or walked everywhere right. Yeah, and that, that's something I, I t I've tried to get to in a few of my videos because it's it's pretty easy to get ag aggregated data for cities or metro areas, but it really doesn't tell the whole story because within any city, like Charlotte, for example, like you could you could do like an average like walk score for the entire city, and it might come out pretty bad, and it does. But within that, there are still a lot of neighborhoods that are very walkable. So, you know, every I think every city is like that. Every city has has its particular neighborhoods or or zip codes where you can still find walkability, even if the city as a whole is has kind of a reputation as being um, very, very car oriented. Yeah. What has been your biggest surprise of, you know, the cities that you have gone out and visited uh, to do one of these city profile videos? <laughs> um, I mean, it probably was Charlotte because I, I literally was because I was thinking in advance because I wanted to do a little bit of advanced planning for the video. It's, oh, what's this going to be about and where should I go to film stuff? And the first thing I kind of realized when I was researching Charlotte was, oh, yeah, it scores extremely poorly on all these sprawl metrics and on walkability. So it might be really hard for me to find things things to shine a positive light on. And then when I got there, and it probably helped that Strong Towns was happening there in the Congress for the new urbanism, um, because there were lots of folks there who, um, who are locals who are more than happy to either tell me about or show me the areas of the city that are densifying or that are getting new bike facilities or, you know, which, which, which stops along the, the transit line or are, are getting a lot of transit oriented development or becoming more walkable. Um, but, but that did surprise me. Um, I guess the other one that surprised me and it probably shouldn't have, but Montreal, <laughs> Montreal, which I visited, uh, in August, I guess, cause I hadn't really, I hadn't really spent time in Montreal before. And I'd heard lots of good things and I've seen pictures and video, but it was another thing entirely to go there. And I was, I was fortunate that uh, a fellow YouTuber had like a, a, a membership key for the, the Bixie bike share system. They just lent me. And so I could just take the bike share everywhere, but the bike share was amazing. The bike facilities they have, there are amazing. And, and probably the best thing I think for, for any bike city is that there are just a lot of people out on bikes. I mean, you could build all the infrastructure, but if still no one's biking, then it's not going to feel very safe or comfortable. But when there are a lot, like I always think it's, it, it comes to safety in numbers. If there are a lot of people out biking and particularly if the facilities are protected or separated, then it's going to feel like a great biking experience. And so that's what Montreal, ha Montreal has in spades is, you know, as long as it's not like January and there's a ton of snow on the ground, which you can bike in that, but, but if, if, if the weather's 
decent or nice, there are just tons of people out on, on bikes. And I don't know, like you don't see a whole lot of that in North America. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I will, uh, echo what you said about Charlotte and about, uh, Montreal, uh, on, in slightly different, uh, perspectives. Uh, I too was just absolutely blown away by what I experienced in Charlotte, it, mainly because I had low expectations. <laughs> you know, I didn't really expect it to be very good. Um, but it, it turned out, especially since I filmed uh, three different uh, bike tours uh, associated with the Congress for New Urbanism, uh, I was able to see uh, some of the amazing uh, developments that were happening, some of the infill developments, and uh, also an emerging bicycle network that was really quite impressive and integrated with their transit, which I was like, yes, mm-hmm. this is yeah. this is this is heading in the right direction. With regards to Montreal, um, Montreal, of course, is a wonderful success story in North America for folks. If you're tuning into this and you don't know the story of Montreal get up there. I mean, they've been working at this for the past four to five decades. They've been building out uh, a comprehensive network of walking and biking facilities with integration of transit and uh, just some amazing features to the city and all sorts of gentle density everywhere. I mean, it's just, oh, yeah. it reminds everywhere. me of Paris. Everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. yeah. It reminds me of Paris, just a, a couple stories shorter. Instead of that fourth and fifth story, you've got that third and fourth story is, is kind of where you're at there. The, the walk-ups in, of Montreal are world famous. The other yeah. thing that's world famous. I think the joke we were making was like in, in a lot of American cities or maybe most American cities, we always talk about the missing middle. Yeah. In Montreal, the middle's there. Everything else is missing. <laughs> they took it all. <laughs> yeah. There aren't that many high rises and there's like hardly yeah. any single family houses. It's, it's just all yeah. middle everywhere. If you're wondering Sorry, where your missing middle is, North America, uh, <laughs> Montreal, they took them. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. they have it. Uh, yeah. The other thing I wanted to mention about Montreal, which is, was truly extraordinary or, and I don't know if you, you experienced this or not, Ray, was the, uh, the alleyways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they the, the, the Royal Barrack or whatever. Yeah, yes. I tried to capture them for my video and I couldn't quite, I don't know. I didn't have enough footage or enough uh, well-formed ideas about what I was looking at. So I didn't really include it in the video, but it was something uh, it was something I wanted. I definitely tried to explore while I was dude, there. Dude, I, I, want, I, I wish I would have known you were going to be there. I would have actually hooked you up with a tour guide. That's his specialty mm. is taking people on alleyway tours. Uh, oh, by bike it is super super cool um but uh yeah good stuff well, i might i might be going back next year so okay maybe, uh, maybe i'll do that yeah well if you have a chance to go during their june bike celebration uh the the two big bike events that they have right there in the city of montreal highly recommended and and again for for the audience here highly recommended the uh, tour uh la nuit which is the friday night bike tour uh that goes off right as sunset is happening and then on sunday is a uh, tour de Ile, which goes around uh, the montreal a, as an island and uh it's tens of thousands of people come out to ride and it's really their celebration of getting out on bikes and active mobility um, and celebration from a long, hard winter. You know, they just, they, yeah. they try to soak up every little bit of sunshine in the summertime as they can. So yeah, it's good stuff. So I, I, I was curious. So I was like, okay, well, where's the next city visit uh, on this? And I'm, I'm kind of scrolling and I'm scrolling and I'm scrolling. It looks like it was. It's probably Minneapolis, right? It's Minneapolis is the next city visit. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, it's already 238. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't it's check cool. the view numbers on these. Yeah. It's over. Yeah. I, I, I didn't know that was over 200. Yeah. I, Minneapolis is great too. Um, and that's where like uh, half of my family is from Minneapolis. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm familiar with the, the city. It's a, it's a good U.S. bike city. It gets cold. Yeah. Like Montreal, I guess. But it has, yeah, it has a lot of elements that I really like. And and that's another one that I'll probably go back to. Um, and I felt bad because I didn't really get to spend time in St. Paul. So maybe next time I go, I'll, I'll focus oh. on St. Paul. Yeah, instead. yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, but but it is interesting. I do think, yeah, these these city visit things I do, I think they do pick up the algorithm or, or maybe just word of mouth pushes them out to like more local people who might not have heard of my channel before. But now that mm-hmm. I'm talking about their city, then then they're they're interested. So 
yeah, that's what I would chalk that up to. Yeah. Yeah. That's good stuff. Now your, your channel has had a long history with, um, with stadiums and football stadiums <laughs> and your relatively recent top 10 college football stadiums that don't completely ruin your city is, is kind of a, again, it goes along the top 10 list, but why don't you explain the other relationship that you have with sporting stadiums, uh, that existed in the early days of your, your channel? <laughs> Do you want me to just kind of walk through the, the, my history of doing, videos about stadiums yeah that well, i mean it, you it was i i found it very endearing that you know in in those you made that comparison to uh your subscriber list this is what i'm going oh. with the number of subscribers <laughs> to okay. stadiums right, uh right, so right, right. yeah i, I, I thought that was a really uh, you even forgot <laughs> you didn't even know, know which way i was going on that yeah no i, no, I see okay, okay. <laughs> well first of all like that college football one is interesting because I had already done similar videos on like kind of rating the urbanism of NFL stadiums and major league baseball ballparks and NBA slash NHL arenas and major league soccer stadiums. And so it was obvious to do something around college football at some point. And I kind of wanted to do it right at the beginning of college football season because I thought, that's when there would be the most interest around. And that one still has not crept over 100,000 views yet. That's like it's my close. least It's my yeah. least viewed video in the last several months, I think. But that's fine because th those are ones that I know that a lot of my audience, a lot of my audience like just doesn't care about sports. And I get that. Sports is trivial. Um, but I also think I also think it's, you know, it can be integral to a city's identity and, and, and it's something that brings people together and, and makes them feel a shared identity with, you know, the place they live or the place they grew up. And, and so you can feel like whichever way you want to feel about sports, but I think it's hard to, it would be hard to argue that they don't play an important role in the way like a city defines itself or the way, the way people come together over like shared wins and losses or whatever. So anyway, but I'm, I'm a, I'm kind of a big uh, Seattle sports fan from going way back. So anyway, I don't know. I don't know how, in fact, I think the first time I did the subscriber count thing was, I think one of my sisters said, wow, you have, you, I think I had like 18,000 or 19,000 subscribers. And they said, Oh, you have, you have enough subscribers to fill the, uh, and I think it's, it's called climate pledge arena, which is where the Seattle NHL hockey team plays, but it's the same building where the Sonics used to play when it was called key arena. And I don't know. And, and it, 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 it created a, a very, uh, it was easy for me to envision that I was like, Oh wow. All the people who subscribed to my channel would fill that arena. I thought that's kind of interesting. Maybe I'll, just throw that in the video. And I kind of knew once I did that, I was going to have to kind of come back and revisit it. Um, so I actually, <laughs> actually created a master list of like all the, all the arenas and different kinds of stadiums in like the major sports, not just in the U S and Canada, but also like the Mexican soccer league. And then ultimately I think the different European soccer leagues, cause I always wanted there to be some kind of stadium that I could say, was the was the most recent one I was able to to fill up, and it was, and then I would always be able to add some kind of commentary about the stadium itself, or like how it interfaced with the neighborhood, or what the parking situation was. So I'd spend like twenty or thirty seconds on that every week, and eventually I just kind of ran out because eventually I filled the the University of Michigan Stadium, which is <laughs> the, the biggest one that you can get good aerial photography of. Um, yeah. So like not counting like India or. Yeah. North yeah. Korea. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, 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 I found that to be really, really cool. And, 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 and quite honestly, I mean, I, I, I have to be very, very, um, grateful and, and humble, uh, about the fact that, yeah, nearly 7,000 people have subscribed to my channel. And if I, in part of your visualization that you were talking about there is that's a lot of people, 7,000 people. I mean, that's, that's like, 1.5 times the size of the little town that I grew up in. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it, it's, that is a, a, an awful lot of people. And so we're all incredibly great and, and privileged and, and lucky to be able to do this sort of work. And, and um, 
I, I love that you mentioned, uh, you know, the Michigan Stadium because, yeah, it's that's where I did my graduate work was uh, was at uh, Ann Arbor and and uh, U of M Stadium is just, you know, one of those fabulous, you know, you know, places. Uh, my undergrad, by the way, also got an honor, honorable mention in uh, the USC there in Los Angeles. And so uh, the L.A. Coliseum, um, which uh, I don't think I don't, I'm not sure if you mentioned it or not. But, yeah, it's wonderful that there is now viable metro lines and transit lines in Los Angeles, you know, taking us back, you know, to the origins of L.A. Uh, my great, great grandfather worked on the red car lines there uh, wow. in in Los Angeles at the turn of the century. And so a lot of people don't realize just how extensive uh, L.A.'s streetcar line system was. And so it's wonderful to see that sort of transit coming back to the L.A. area and the fact that you can get off right there at the expo station right at the Coliseum, get down to downtown, get up to where my family was up in the, in the Pasadena area and all that. Um, it's, there's a lot of really, really cool stuff happening, um, across the continent, around the, you know, and around the globe too. Uh, talk a little bit about that, you know, cause you'd mentioned that this particular video that we were just looking at sitting at 99,000 uh, people and you know, it's like, ah, maybe it's a sports thing. Um, I know on my channel, I'm getting a lot of international viewers. Are you seeing that too? Or is in terms of like a, a, a lot of people tuning in from around the globe? Uh, I don't. Yeah, because I can see all those metrics on my dashboard. And yeah, I actually did a thing. I think I did. Well, I've done a couple uh, like live streams where I did a fun, what I think is a fun countdown of like the top 10 or 20 cities where my viewership comes from. And they're all, let's see, if I do like the top 25, I think there are like 20, 19 of them are US cities. And then I think you get Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver, and you get London, UK, and you get uh, Sydney and Melbourne. So they're all English speaking cities. I mean, Montreal, yeah, sort of. They're, they're English speaking though. Actually, <laughs> actually right now, I think if you, if you just filter for 2023, you actually get you actually get Madrid <laughs> in the top thirty or so, which, ah. is, which is fun. Just because I did a lot of yeah. Spanish content early in the year, even though it's in English, I think you know there are a lot of folks who do speak at least some English or or maybe fluently, um, or 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 it's possible for them to get like subtitles. I think so. Anyway, but but it's yeah, it's not super international for for whatever reason, um, and I've tried to do. Mexico specific content and I just don't get a whole lot of views on it, which is disappointing because I, I, I really um, I really think there's a lot of interesting stuff that just just accepting that my, my viewer base is primarily U.S. I think there's a lot of stuff that U.S. cities can learn from like Mexican urbanism if we pay, if we were paying attention to it. So so I do like to cover that as well. And I'd like to go further afield. I mean, I'd like to do more international travel and more filming on the location, but um, I don't know. That's it, it, There are a lot of practical considerations related to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you and I spend a, an awful lot of time out on uh, social media, uh, probably more time than either of us should be spending out on social media. But <laughs> um, I, I had to laugh when I saw this post uh, from yesterday where you were like, oh, good news. <laughs> I hope, I hope I didn't put that guy on blast. It was a, that's from an Instagram story that this guy posted and tagged me in. And he was just kind of letting all of his followers know. And I think, he, I, don't, I don't know how many followers he had, not, not as many as I have, I guess. He was just letting people know, hey, I really think this is an important video for you to watch. And, you know, if, if you can prove to me that you watched it, I'll send you five bucks. And <laughs> and I just, I just kind of reposted it and I said, hey, <laughs> this guy's going to give you five. Maybe that wasn't nice or something, but, but he he thought it was funny, so I think it was. Oh all good. man, um, that's but that's hilarious. I don't know. It's cool when, yeah, when people feel strongly uh, about the stuff, or that they, they they feel like they heard something articulated in a way that they hadn't heard it before that they thought was useful, or they they just learned something different, or if they were just entertained. I mean, those those all feel good to me. So, and that's. It's YouTube. I'm not making like a whole ton of money or anything like that. So, so it's really, really knowing that I'm like impacting someone's life in a positive way is, is really uh, probably the most where I get the most gratification. So, 
Well, let's stick with that 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 line of thought there, um, because it is pretty gratifying that when uh, you know somebody recognizes you on an airplane or you know you're out in public and somebody says, "Oh, nerd, city nerd," <laughs> uh, as well as when people show up to ride with you. Talk a little bit about this visit, uh, you know, to to Seattle and how cool it was <laughs> to like have a whole bunch of people show up and go for a bike ride with you. Yeah, and this is something a lot of. Uh, YouTubers do, they do like fan meetups or whatever. And I hadn't done that before. I mean, I met a lot of people when we were in Charlotte, um, but they weren't there specifically for me, you know, but, but there might be people watch my channel and get value out of it or whatever. And I went to sort of, it was sort of a fan gathering in Montreal. That's the reason I was in Montreal, but it was really, there were, there were like six different YouTube channels represented. And, and, uh, and so, um, I don't know, like it wasn't a huge gathering. And so I decided I wanted to do something in Seattle because I know I have a lot of viewers in Seattle and it's where I'm from. And I knew I was going to have some time to spend up there. So, um, I got with this, uh, you know, this urbanism blog, uh, that covers like local Seattle, uh, like transportation and development news called the urbanist and said, yeah, let's, let's put on an event and, you know, it can be kind of like a fan meetup, but, but we'll run it and, and, uh, you know. We kind of set it up as a as a group bike ride, finishing up at a, a pub where we could have a gathering. And I think they set up like an event bright that had fifty slots in it because that's something about like what they get for their usual meetups. And those disappeared right away. So they extended it to a hundred. Those disappeared right away, and then they did two hundred fifty, and those sold out too. And there were still people who showed up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so a lot of people came out. It was a gorgeous day. It was a perfect day for a bike ride along Lake Washington Boulevard, which is normally uh, one lane in each direction for cars and really not hospitable to bikes at all. And and like for a few weekends of summer, they they close it to cars. So just people on bikes or, or rolling or doing whatever or running or walking can, can kind of take it over. And so it, that's just like the greatest feeling um, when we have these open street events and people really come out and enjoy it and use it. Um, and so, you know, in my mind, a lot of those people might've been out there regardless, <laughs> but, but you know, they, they, they showed up and, and we all got to ride together and I met so many people. Um, it was, it was very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And we've been watching some of the video uh, from the channel that uh, that you mentioned, The Urbanist, and I'll make sure that we include a link to uh, his video here. We got we got permission from him to go ahead and show this. And so that super, yeah. super cool. Yeah. yeah. And they do they do fantastic work, too. It's like if I want to know what's going on in Seattle, that's that's where I go. And and so, um, you know, if you if you fall if you want to follow Seattle stuff, that's you should go and, and read them and support them if you can. I would say that. Yeah. So sticking with that kind of concept of, of what it means to have like a following and a sense of community, dive a little bit deeper into, you know, what that's been like, you know, being able to have a whole bunch of, uh, you know, a fan, a fan base of city nerd fans. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's, it's interesting because I, I just, you know, I didn't know, uh, when I started the channel and, the, and, and <laughs> I guess related to the video I put out this week, which the idea around the video was just trying to de define what urbanism, what urbanism is and who urbanists are and what they care about, at least from my point of view. And so, so that's kind of what this week's video is about. And really the genesis of that is like when I started the channel, like the only, the only context I ever heard the word urbanism or urbanist was really in the context of the Congress for the new urbanism, which is a very specific thing. That's about like architecture and urban design styles. And it's not what we really talk about. Um, when we talk about urbanism, I think in the, I don't know if I want to call it like an activist community or an advocacy community, but it's taken on, um, kind of a different meaning. I think in the last two years at least, probably probably more than that. And it seems to encompass uh, a lot of things related to, you know, people, people wanting to live in cities because of all the great amenities and opportunities that cities provide and, you know, the ability to live without a car or live car light and be able to do the things you need to do using transit or walking or biking, but also to be able to do it affordably. And I kind of feel like that's been kind of the 
kind of the catalytic thing is is housing affordability that's really brought the urbanism issue kind of to the forefront and in the zeitgeist in a lot of ways. And so I kind of feel like I kind of started my channel at a fortuitous time where that was emerging as something that people cared a lot about. Yeah. So it's been interesting to be, um, I don't know, like a little bit of a focal point or maybe a little, have a little bit of a, I don't know, like a, a voice or a leadership role in what I think of as a movement. And there are a lot of people, um, you know, not everybody agrees about everything. So, you know, I don't expect everybody to agree with what I have to say, but it's been interesting to, to be able to be part of that dialogue and, and kind of, kind of help maybe be someone who helps define what that is and, and what we're, what we're aiming for and talking about, well, how things should be and why they aren't the way we want them to be and why our cities haven't made the same progress as, you know, like European cities or Asian cities, certain Asian cities. So I'm somewhat comfortable with like kind of what my role is in that. Um, I'm pretty active on social media and I talk about all these issues every week in my videos. Um, and so I don't know. I, I'm comfortable with it. It's not what I expected, um, but, <laughs> but it's 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 been interesting, and and it's it's uh it's pretty gratifying just to um, to have a voice that you know people listen to and and uh, that that helps. I don't know. Like I talk about something different every week, so in in a small way, I maybe like help kind of set the agenda for what people are talking about. At least maybe maybe like one percent of that or something, which is one percent more than what I probably had before. So right, yeah. So your pen tweet uh, or whatever Elon's calling <laughs> these things now uh, post is with Nebula. So this is this is relatively new for you, right? Yeah, uh, I signed on with Nebula. I think right before I left for Spain, so it was kind of towards the end of January, and it, it's just a uh, um, I don't know. There are a few reasons for it. They, they have a uh, um, I mean, it's, it's primarily a kind of like a Netflix. It's kind of like a streaming service for YouTubers, I guess. I don't want to pigeonhole it too much because they do, a, they do several different things, but, but it's kind of a place for YouTubers who work in, um, like kind of technology and culture, uh, uh, entertainment there are certain certain niches that that nebula kind of brings together and then they also provide a certain amount of like technical support for i don't know just kind of helping you improve the workflow of what you're doing so that was valuable to me as well and then there's like a little bit of an ownership piece in there too like by signing on with nebula like i i own a little piece of it and so so there's there's kind of a there's kind of like a diversification thing for me, like kind of all my eggs are in the YouTube basket. And so like, what if some billionaire decides to buy YouTube and completely change how they do business? Like that never happens. Um, yeah, that never happens. So, <laughs> <laughs> so then, then what do I do? Like, I, I feel, I feel very vulnerable um, because that's by far my primary platform for, you know, uh, you know, talking to people and, and, uh, and making some income. And, and so, so Nebula is a way to, to kind of diversify that. So if something happened to YouTube, then Nebula would be there and I would still have a platform to, to, to put my content content out on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and for folks who are going, what, what really is this? It, it, like you said, yeah, it's very much just like a, a, a subscription type of situation, you know, similar to, to a Netflix. And so, you know, folks, you can, you can actually pay. Uh, this looks like a lifetime membership is the current deal going on. Otherwise this super, super cheap. It's like $2 or something, you know, is, is like the ongoing kind of thing per month. That's, that, that's a, a really good deal. Uh, you got great content creators, uh, uh, Jason Slaughter with Not Just Bikes is out there. RM Transit is out there. Uh, City Beautiful is out there. So a lot of good urbanism is out there. And, you know, for, for those of you who are primarily, you know, consuming our content, 
you know, especially like an hour long interview like this, um, you know, it's, it's nice to have another option where you don't get served up a YouTube commercial, you know, every certain number of minutes. Uh, it's not as big of a, an issue with a shorter form content, but it's certainly an issue that I hear about with my longer interviews because that'll get interrupted multiple times. So having access to uh, Nebula is a, is a super cool thing. I'm not big enough yet to be invited to Nebula, but maybe someday I'll keep my fingers crossed. Um, But, you know, and I'll I'll give a, a plug to my Patreon as well as your Patreon is that that is one of the benefits that I'm able to provide to my patrons is I give you access to all of this content uh, commercial free. So I upload it to a completely different uh, video platform. I load it up to Vimeo. I give you uh, a password protected access so that you can watch this content without any of the uh, commercials. So yeah, we love, yeah. we love you YouTube, but at the same time, uh, <laughs> yeah, we want, we want to have some diversification. We want to have some options. And so yeah. that's one of the, the benefits that I do extend to, to my Patreon supporters. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about your community and your patrons, because I know that you do, you can shout them out uh, every, every episode that you put out. And you, you do talk a, a lot about the fact that you get some of those ideas from that. So you are developing a, a good interactive community uh, there in Patreon too. Yeah. Yeah. No, the Patreon's great. Um, you know, both in terms of obviously it it helps with, you know, sustaining what I'm doing. Like I, you know, if, if I'm not making like a certain amount of income, then I have to go back to consulting and then I can't do a YouTube channel. So we don't want that. That's that's the reality of it. Um, (laughs) obviously the Patreon's great for that, but, but also it's a way of, um, what, what I've found really valuable is it's a way of, uh, kind of curating a group of people who are literally invested in what you're doing. So they obviously care enough about it to like go to a website and like, I don't know, Patreon makes it easy. If you're already a patron somewhere else, then it makes it easy for you to become a patron of you know some other, some other creators. So that's fine. But, it's, uh, but they have to make a decision to actually do that. And so I do find that I do get, like the, the the comments and the interactions I have on my Patreon site tend to be like more thoughtful and, and more illuminating on average than like the YouTube comment section. Not that there aren't good things on the YouTube comment section too, but I can't even read. All, there's just it's just too much, and it gets I don't know. There's too much spam that happens too, and that that doesn't exist on the Patreon. So on my on my Patreon, I do. I do at least one post a week where I kind of talk about that week's video and give kind of a behind the scenes look of how I thought through it and what I thought was interesting about it or what mattered and why I did this, but not that. And I'll usually pose a question to my patrons and so we'll have like a long discussion thread. And then, yeah, it also has, it has a messaging feature on it too. So people can message me and they pretty much always respond to messages I get from patrons. Um, although it can, it can take time sometimes, but, uh, but, but they're almost always, I, I think very valuable. They're sending me something like I haven't read before that's interesting, or they have an idea that's interesting, or they want to let me know about an experience they had that they thought I would think was funny or Uh, instructive in some way. So, so I just get a lot of value out of having that community. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Hey, to close us out, why don't you, you know, kind of look back in the last, you know, week, two weeks, month or whatever, any, any controversies, any things that kind of bubble up that uh, you want to kind of mention and, and, and kind of riff about? (laughs) Controversy. Uh, not really. Hey, I know that, um, well, so this, this is going to go out like a month later than we're talking about, but I know that, uh, um, Brightline Orlando opened today, the day we're taping and a, a few of my creator friends are actually out there riding the first rides. I actually did get well, invited. Well, Alan, yeah. I, Alan, Alan, Alan's I, out there. And Alan, Miles Alan Miles Fisher is there and he also was on that same, uh, uh, panel that you and I were on That's right. uh, yep. at Strongtown's get national yep. gathering. So yeah, he's been live tweeting it, uh, from this yep. morning. Yep. Uh, and so, yeah, that's super, super exciting. In fact, I reply to him that I'm going to be in Orlando in like a week. 
Yeah. So um, I don't think I'm going to have a chance to jump on the bright line. But yeah, talk a little bit about that. I mean, this is like, it, it's not perfect as he, he mentioned, but this is kind of big news is that Florida yeah. now has a decent train service from, from I, Miami I to Orlando. So. I think so. Yeah. And I just want to plug miles in transit. It's a, he, he has a smaller channel, but he's down there and he'll, he'll be, he'll be doing some content on that as well. And, and, uh, you know, it, it, everybody responds differently to different, uh, styles on YouTube. I really enjoy miles. I think he's hilarious. Um, and so I'll, I look forward to both Alan and miles take on, uh, the bright line. Yeah. So, so the bright line folks actually invited me to come out for that as well. I had a conflict anyway. And, and plus, I don't know, I knew several other people are going to be out there doing yeah. like, I don't know. I'm not that train focused. Like some of these other <laughs> creators are very train focused. Um, and so that's cool. I'll go do it later, but I do think it's really important because I do, um, you know, my very first video is about, uh, you know, where should we be building high speed rail in the U S it was some, it was just something that had been gnawing on me for years. Every time I saw that map of, um, that map of, uh, yeah, there it uh, is right uh, there. Uh, that very, that very first yeah, the one on the upper left. That was the video that first started getting me subscribers. Like I, I probably didn't get subscribers until after like my third video or whatever it came out. But that was the one that the algorithm finally picked up and said, oh, people are kind of enjoying this. Yeah, Let's push this out a little more. And so that was, that was the one that really got the ball rolling for my channel. And I always come back to like the concepts I talk about in that video are things I come back to every time I talk about yeah. high speed rail and including like when I went to Spain, I, I rode the, the Ave and, and, and a couple of the other trains. Um, and I talked about it then as well. So the bright line really is like the first, like kind of dedicated purpose built. And it is high speed. Like it's not, it's not like 200 miles per hour. Or whatever. I think it, it hits like 150, but that's pretty good. I'm like between in the segment between uh, West Palm beach and Orlando. Yeah. There are other segments that are problematic. It's got like at grade crossings and things like that. And I know that they have, they've had some safety issues, but the fact that a private company was able to build that service and be be able to run it hourly between Miami and Orlando, I think is really exciting. And, and Brightline is, is, uh, is behind the LA to Las Vegas line that would be completely grade separated. I think it would primarily run in, median of i10 if i remember Mm -hmm. right so so yeah it's i mean with whatever problems brightline florida has i still think this is a very this is a very positive optimistic day for those of us who care about intercity passenger rail in the u.s um just kind of understanding that like if we leave it to the federal government and Amtrak, like, I don't know, like there's a lot of stuff that might not get, get done, but if we have private companies that see profitability and they can get it done, I don't know, like I'm not opposed to that. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully it's a success with ridership and then, you know, it becomes I don't know if I would say a model, but it become it becomes a data point that, you know, Texas can look at and California can look at and go, oh, yeah, we need to get this thing finished up because the, you know, both of those states or like Seattle to Portland, Portland, Vancouver, or, you know, any of the, any of these other places where we've conceived of having high speed rail, they could get a kickstart if this becomes a really positive data point for the demand for, for people to, to get from city to city in, you know, two to three hours, a a reasonable price point. Yeah. Yeah. And again, one of your more popular videos is in fact, just from six months ago at 266,000 views is, is the passenger rail uh, comparison between uh, Spain and the U S and you know, your, your subtitle is brace yourself (laughs) for utter chagrin (laughs) because it's pretty sad. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I think, uh, you know, if, if you're, if you're fortunate enough to have been able to go overseas, either to Europe or I don't know, Japan or South Korea or Taiwan and, and ride true high speed rail, like it'll, it'll just change your mind about things. It's such a completely different experience from flying. And I really do like to travel. So, so I can, I can, I can stomach flying. I just, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But the no, flying the I, flying experience is just kind of terrible. And once once you've once you've taken a train that that actually accomplishes the trip faster, 
end is actually comfortable to be on where you can like get work done or reading or or whatever or just walk around and stretch or have some food i mean it's just it's just so it's so superior in every way yeah 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 it's uh i i'm the same way i i really you know i i would prefer not to have to fly just to get around to cities here in north america um Mm -hmm. it's it's just not a very fun experience um i actually don't mind road trips I mean, I, I don't mind long distance road trips. I'm, I, I'm a good driver in the sense that I can, you know, put a podcast in, you know, episode in or whatever audio book and, 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 and drive. I, I prefer like the, the quieter, uh, roads in rural environments. I don't like being on interstates so much. They're just too fast. Plus I like seeing the little towns that, you know, used to exist when we did have rail and we did have <laughs> like little, you know, state highway types of things. So I don't mind. And I, and I, I don't mind the road trip and I try to do that uh, each year, make my way up to Colorado and back, uh, just dipping my toe into uh, New Mexico just a little bit, which is where you're at right now, right? Is in New Mexico? Yeah. Yep. Um, But what I hear is that maybe, 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 uh, you know, the the dead option for a uh, high speed rail option here in uh, the San Antonio to Austin area might be coming back to life as well Mm -hmm. as some of the other Texas uh, high speed rail options, which uh, right now they're trying to figure out how to connect uh, San Antonio, Houston and Dallas, which come on, if you're going to do that, you got to connect Austin too. So yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Good stuff. And I, Again, I'd be honored to have you come visit uh, here in in Austin, Texas. That goes out to the audience as well. I've had several of you uh, hit me up when you've been passing through town. I love uh, taking people out for uh, bike tours of the our emerging uh, Dutch-inspired cycle network. Uh, it e- even includes the Dutch Red Cycle Pass, uh, nice. which is really nice. They use the pigment in the uh, concrete uh, slurry mix, so it's not paint. It's actually integrated into the actual uh, concrete, which is really super cool. So one of these yep. days yep come visit for sure yeah. <laughs> ray hey thank you so much for joining me on the active towns podcast it's been an absolute yeah. honor and pleasure yeah thanks for having me on hey thank you all so much for tuning in i hope you enjoyed this episode with ray delahanty the city nerd uh and if you did please give it a thumbs up leave a comment down below and share it with a friend and if you haven't done so already i'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell And if you are enjoying my content, please consider supporting my efforts and becoming an Active Towns ambassador. There's many ways that you can do it. Just head on over to activetowns.org and you can click on the support button there and uh, you can become a Patreon supporter. Uh, The patrons do get access to all of this content early and ad free. Uh, You can also make a donation to the nonprofit. Uh, Buy me a coffee is also an option as well as buying things from the Active Town store. We've got some t-shirts and water bottles, all sorts of good stuff, Uh, Streets of Earth People swag out there, and every little bit helps. Uh, Thank you all so much for everybody who is tuning in each week, watching these uh, videos, and uh, hey, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.